our next talk, it's uh, professor, by Professor Achim Kemp from the University of Waterloo. He's going to talk about uh, predictions for quantum gravitational signatures from inflation. So Achim, whenever you want, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so my talk today is going to be about predictions of quantum gravity signatures uh, from inflation in the cosmic microwave background and in cosmic structure formation. This is work that I did with uh, two collaborators, Aidan Chadwin Davis and Peter Smidgia. And we have been working on this for a few years now already. Um, two weeks ago, or even less than two weeks ago, we put out our results on the archive. And here are the two archive numbers. There's a short paper of six pages and then there's a long paper of 50 pages and that might give you some indication of the struggle that we went through <laughs> it was pretty difficult uh, some of the, the most difficult calculations i've ever done so the six paper six pages paper is a summary and the 50 pages paper goes into all of the details here's the overview <clears throat> the messages of this talk are as follows First of all, we all expect that there is some natural ultraviolet cutoff in nature. And that's because we think that um, the very notion of distance doesn't make sense beyond a certain smallest length scale. And the intuition for that is, of course, that if you try to resolve a distance very accurately, you must have momentum uncertainty that is increasing, but momentum and energy uncertainty leads to curvature uncertainty. And that feeds back into our attempt to resolve distances closely. Because if you don't know the curvature between two points, we can't know their distance either. So from that simple consideration, we expect that the very notion of distance uh, loses operational meaning uh, beyond a certain length scale. Let's call that length scale uh, LC for L cutoff. Now that length scale is presumably within one well-known interval. Namely, as we just discussed, the cutoff length is probably not smaller than the Planck length. By the Planck length, the latest, we expect this phenomenon to kick in. On the other hand, we also know that it, this length scale is bounded from above by the Hubble scale during inflation. I will get into that, uh, of course, in detail. Then the second message is that precision cosmology data can squeeze that interval further, and hopefully we will be able to pin down exactly where LC is and perhaps measure quantum gravity effects that go along with it. Of course, that's going to be a challenge experimentally and theoretically. Now, I'm not an experimentalist. I don't know how hard that is. But as a theoretician, as, the, as theoreticians, we can already do something. Namely, we can, for example, and we advocate for that here, use the phenomenon that when you model something with few parameters, then this generally allows template search. It means that if you know exactly what you're looking for, then what you're not looking for, you can filter out. And that allows you to reduce the noise and that improves the signal to noise ratio and that can be very useful. So this only works, of course, if you have very few parameters in your model. Uh, so that's what we're going for. Um, that's the next message, namely that we will um, that we studied a one parameter model of what that natural ultraviolet cutoff could be. And that uh, model is that of a bandwidth of a, um, a covariant finite bandwidth. Um, you've heard me, probably all of you have heard me talk by now about covariant bandwidth, so I keep that part relatively short. And uh, now what is new is that we can predict on the basis of such a bandwidth and on the basis of what is currently the best, uh, is currently the standard model of inflationary cosmology, uh, we can predict explicitly a one parameter family of signature templates for the primordial power spectrum. All of this with the hope that we can squeeze that interval in which 
the cutoff length um, is presumably to be found. So let's get into it. Um, the first claim is that the ultraviolet cutoff scale LC is within a known interval. Um, but what is the value of that cutoff scale LC? Well, the theoretical lower bound is the Planck length, of course, and the experimental upper bound is the Hubble length during inflation. So we can write down this inequality here. Now, how big is that interval? Well, it turns out that the Hubble scale during inflation is something like by six, four, five, six orders of magnitude larger than the Planck length. The Hubble scale during inflation, the Hubble length during inflation um, actually varies. It goes from something like 10 to the four Planck lengths to 10 to the six Planck lengths or so. Um, and in that interval of only about, let's say, maximally five or six orders of magnitude, that's where the cutoff should happen. And the claim here is that cosmological data can further squeeze that interval. In fact, already we can squeeze that interval tighter. Let's, for example, assume, just as a Gedanken experiment, that the cutoff length scale was actually the same as the Hubble scale during inflation. Well, in that case, the impact of the cutoff on inflation, the impact of this ultraviolet cutoff on the quantum field theoretical calculations of inflation would be of order one. And that means the inflationary predictions would not match experimental data. We can already rule out that the cutoff length is the Hubble's length during inflation. And our accuracy, our precision is a bit better than order one. And so we can actually push that interval, the size of that interval a little bit tighter um, from LH to even smaller length. Overall, the principle is that the more precisely we can measure inflation or inflationary predictions, the more precisely we can test inflation, the smaller the LC values are that we can detect. That is, the tighter we can squeeze that interval. So what's the status of the measurements at the moment? Well, the cosmic microwave background has been measured to have an average temperature of about 2.7 Kelvin. The primordial quantum fluctuations of the inflaton field and of the metric are, according to the current model, standard model of cosmology, they are thought to have been the origin of inhomogeneities in the temperature distribution in the CMB. And these inhomogeneities, these fluctuations in the temperature of the CMB um, are small. They're actually tough to measure. They are temperature differences that are only of the order of about uh, roughly about four times 10 to the minus five. So the ratio, the, the relative temperature changes are this, but since the average temperature is 2.7 Kelvin, it basically means that um, the temperature fluctuates by about 100 thousandths of a Kelvin in the sky. Now this has been measured and it has been measured with some precision by the Planck satellite and other experiments um, before. Um, I should say I'm using the term precision here, not accuracy, because accuracy would mean that we can actually measure absolute temperatures, which we can't measure that well. The CMB's temperature is not known much better than this, but relative temperatures we can measure very well, and for that we need precision. Okay, so what more precision, what more experimental precision do we expect to be needed so that we become sensitive to the cutoff length LC. Now, in the worst case, well, we don't know where LC is in nature, but if it is as small as the Planck length, then how much more precision do we expect to need? Well, maximally, the difference or the ratio between the Planck length and the Hubble length during inflation is like 10 to the minus six. That would mean that we would expect, naively speaking, without before doing any calculations, we would expect that we have to go six orders of magnitude better 
we would have to measure things with uh, like a million times more accurately to measure the impact of the cutoff on inflationary prediction, right? So if, if the cutoff was at the Hubble scale during inflation, the impact would be of order one, and that's ruled out experimentally already. If the cutoff scale is, the cutoff length is the Planck length, well, then it's six orders of magnitude away, and we expect that correspondingly the effect would be much smaller and therefore much, much harder to measure. What is helpful, however, is that actually this is uh, too pessimistic. Things are better than that. For one, we can not only measure a delta t over t of the order of 10 to the minus 5, which is the amplitudes of the C and B temperature fluctuations. No, we can measure temperatures better than that by at least an order of magnitude. We can actually resolve these temperature fluctuations. We cannot just see them, but resolve them. So there's already one order of magnitude that we have already better than this. And also the Hubble length during inflation is actually changing and it could be as large as only four orders of magnitude away um, from the Planck length at the, uh, at the onset of inflation at the onset of the part of inflation that matters for us uh, cosmologically. So that means we're really six orders of magnitude away. We might be only something like five down to three orders of magnitude away. And that's tantalizing close to the, to the Planck line. So in order to help things along further, um, the um, suggestion is to use template search. Now, how does a template search work? Well, assume we search, let's say, in some experiment, nothing to do with cosmology, just some experiment. We search for a signature, a prediction of a cosine wave. Let's say that's what we predict. We predict some curve that's a cosine. And imagine that this cosine is inside a very noisy signal. So the signal to noise ratio is very poor. There's a lot of noise, very little signal. How the heck are we going to find our cosine in there. Um, now, assume we know something about what we expect. Assume we know that the frequency ought to be in an interval from omega one to omega two, for example. Well, in that case, before checking for the signature, we can filter out already all the frequencies, all the noise of frequencies other than those in that interval. Now, um, more generally, what we're looking for may not be a cosine curve. It may be some sort of chirp, or it may be some other typical um, signal. And what we can do is we can look at these pre predicted functions, which hopefully do not depend on many free parameters. We can look at these functions as basis functions in our function space. And then the orthogonal complement is what we are not, lo not looking for. And that is what we can then filter out in order to improve the signal to noise ratio. And methods like that have been used quite successfully by LIGO. It was initially um, controversial, but it's now confirmed that this is the way to go. So our goal now is to make a predictions for experimental signatures of a cutoff length in the CMB, predictions that hopefully do not depend on many parameters. In fact, we try to keep it down to one parameter and well, we generalized it also to a few parameters, but we really try to keep it down to one parameter only so that the template search is as restrictive as possible so that we can um, turn the search for the signature of this cutoff into a search of the kind, do we see exactly what we predict or do we not see exactly what we predict? So we are not trying to measure out exactly predicted curve. We are trying to find experimentally evidence for the curve being there or not being there. That's template search. So then we need to model this physically somehow. So how can we model in quantum field theory that there exist no space-time distances or wavelengths below some kind of length? You see, that's, that was the overall intuition from that simple argument that if you want to resolve distances very more and more accurately, then the 
momentum uncertainty must go up, energy uncertainty must go up. Generally, momentum and energy uncertainties imply curvature uncertainties, and that implies distance uncertainties again. So we expect that the very notion of distance <clears throat> breaks down, that there simply are no, it makes no sense to say that there are distances or wavelengths, lengths or wavelengths, shorter than a certain cutoff length. Uh, in principle, we can speculate um, in many different ways, because it's not yet experimentally constrained, as to what the physics would be at that cutoff scale. And this might be described by foams, strings, or various other models of what Planck scale physics might be like. But here, <coughs> we are not really, in this work, we are not trying to develop a theory of quantum gravity. Instead, we say, let's imagine we are, let's stay in the region where quantum field theory still holds in the region that goes towards the Planck scale, but doesn't quite reach it, just a few orders of magnitude before, the region where quantum field theory needs to hold in order for the inflationary predictions of cosmology to work. And then we ask, well, in that region where inflation still works, quantum field theory still works, but quantum field theory at the inflationary scale is close to the Planck scale, which means that the Planck scale physics might have left an impact on the quantum field theory already. So quantum field theory coming from low energies to high energies, quantum field theory hasn't broken down yet at the inflationary scale, but it probably has picked up some indications of what is to come at the Planck scale. And so, how the question then is how can we model inside quantum field theory in within the framework of quantum field theory how can we model the absence of lengths or wavelengths below some critical wavelengths lc and so the idea is that we simply model it as exactly that if we want to describe the absence of lengths or wavelengths below a critical length we simply model it literally as the absence of lengths and wavelengths below the critical length. So we make no further assumptions about there being forms or strings or anything. We simply describe quantum field theory with the lengths or wavelengths below a certain threshold being cut off. Now, <clears throat> here's how we model that. We model this covariantly as the absence of fields of such small wavelengths in the quantum field theoretical path integral. So the partition function is normally written as the integral over all field configurations and then e to the power of i times the action. But what we do is we say, well, maybe not all fields. Maybe we should only path integrate over those fields which contain only uh, wavelengths that are reasonable, that are below the cutoff length. And then all fields that do contain wavelengths shorter than that, we just remove from the path integral. We say, well, they, if, if those distances don't make sense, then if those space-time distances don't make sense, then those fields don't make sense. So we remove them from the path integral. <clears throat> As the simplest, um, simplest thing to do, I, I suppose it can be obvious the simplest thing to do if you want to model the absence of such more wavelengths, you model it by removing them from the path integral. Well, knowing that at the Planck scale, there might be a much more um, sophisticated theory of it, but this is how it could show in quantum field theory as you approach the Planck scale, why quantum field theory is still valid. So the space of functions that we are still path integrating over then, is the space of functions whose covariantly defined wavelengths are within um, are larger than the cutoff length LC. So how do we do that? How can we covariantly cut off wavelengths? Well, what is a wavelength anyway? What is a frequency anyway? A frequency is technically speaking an eigenvalue of a derivative operator. A frequency is also an eigenvalue of a second derivative operator. And covariantly, a frequency is an eigenvalue of a d'Alembert operator because that's the frequency operator there. 
So what we do is we say that this that the uh, space of fields that we are path integrating over in the path integral is merely the span of all those fields psi lambda, which are um, <coughs> it's, it's a span of all those fields which are eigenfields of the D'Alembert operator with eigenvalues that are having a modulus smaller than the cutoff scale. The cutoff, cutoff scale, this is a momentum scale, is one over the length scale. Achim, five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, this is equivalent to the absence of fields that are um, too far off shell, as you can see here, if you want to view this in the momentum representation. So it's the absence of fields who virt whose virtual masses would be beyond the Planck mass. Okay, so there's also an information theoretic interpretation of this. Um, in Minkowski space time, we have that the spatial modes of wavelengths below the cutoff lengths possess then exceedingly low bandwidth in time. That is to say that um, in this covariant cut in this book, covariant band limitation, arbitrarily short wavelengths do exist, but um, they are effectively frozen. <coughs> this is actually covariant because both wavelength and bandwidth are Lorentz transforming in such a way that that statement above is actually the same in all frames. In FRW spacetimes, it's the same thing, except that co-moving spatial modes, because they have a they have a different uh, wavelength over time, they have a different bandwidth over time. And they are effectively frozen as long as their physical wavelength is smaller than the cutoff length. And the whole thing is covariant and diffeomorphism invariant. Now, we need to calculate the primordial power spectrum with this cutoff in place. Normally, the, the uh, primordial power spectrum PPS is calculated from the two point function. Here's the, the Green's function, the, uh, the Feynman propagator. And we take the Feynman propagator and then this expression here at equal time momentum trans uh, momentum free transform this gives us the primordial power spectrum here now however we use not this path integral but the path integral with the band limitation built in and then we get this band limited Feynman propagator how can we calculate it well it turns out we can calculate the Feynman propagator by the band limited one by putting these projectors, these band limiting projectors left and right. And the projectors are given by literally just the resolution of the identity in terms of the eigenfunctions psi lambda of the Dunn but not the full resolution of the identity, but only the part that corresponds to those uh, wavelengths that are below the cutoff length. And then we obtain um, the uh, relative um, change in the power spectrum, which is what we are looking for, and the modification of the primordial power spectrum uh, relative to the ordinarily predicted uh, power spectrum. And that can be uh, calculated then as the real part of the change in the Green's function divided by the Green's function and then higher order uh, terms that we, that we are neglecting here. Okay, what are we comparing with? Well, what is the primordial power spectrum normally? Well, the Planck satellite missions observations um, showed us that the primordial power spectrum has this form. There's an amplitude, there is the uh, co-moving momentum, K star is the so-called pivot scale, and this is the spectral index. And here are the numerical values for these. They're known with quite some um, accuracy now. Now, uh, notice that uh, since this number is very small, um, we have an almost a scale invariant power spectrum. Now, inflation ca is capable of deriving this result um, through this formula, where this is the Hubble parameter as a function this of- This came back from a search. Time. Oh, man. Google thinks I'm talking to it. Okay, <laughs> so <clears throat> inflation can reproduce this very accurately where the Hubble parameter as a function of, time, uh, of conformal time is uh, slowly rolling down a hill in, if you want to visualize it. Okay, so all of this is well known. We take this as a background and now we, we calculate the corrections to this. And here is the main result of my talk. The prediction is that the change in the primordial power spectrum is up to a constant C, which is of order one, up to a constant c, it is given by a function sigma of k to the power three half divided by the logarithm of this. And sigma is down here. Sigma is the ratio of the Hubble length during inflation divided by the cutoff length. 
And that number is slightly depending on time because the Hubble length is actually increasing uh, over time during inflation. And um, that's the overall amplitude of the effect that we predict. And it's multiplied with some oscillatory term where the oscillation frequency also depends on the ratio of the Hubble length to the cutoff length. So what we have is this behavior for the amplitude of what we predict, and this is the oscillation. So what are the overall, let's discuss that. What, what, is, what are we really predicting here qualitatively? Well, the interpretation of the prediction is this. Here's the prediction again. First of all, it's a chirp oscillation. So we're predicting that the primordial power spectrum has superimposed oscillations, which are a chirp, because this omega is actually time dependent. You see, here's the omega. It depends on the sigma, and the sigma depends on time. So it's a chirp. And also, the amplitude changes over time. The amplitude scales as sigma to the power 3 half, which is to say it, it uh, scales as cutoff length over Hubble length to the power 3 half. That's very important. What this means is that if the cutoff scale is the Hubble length, if the cutoff length is the Hubble length, very unlikely, but if it were, then that would be good for us because it would mean, well, the effect is of order one, as we discussed earlier in this presentation, it would be of order one and we have a big effect. So that could not be missed. We would know it. Right? We could already say, oh, this is the cutoff length. We see it, but we don't see it. Inflation still works. So Achim, you're technically out of time. You can be writing into your question time, I guess, but uh, technically. Uh, it's 2.53, 2.54 now, isn't it? Uh, it's 25 minutes plus five minutes question, and you yeah, have yeah. 26 okay. minutes, 18 seconds now. Uh, all right, okay. You see, I'm running the, the time. I thought I have two more minutes, okay. Okay, so on the other hand, it also means that if the cut of scale is actually at the Planck scale, then it's a really poor scaling because it's actually the amplitude goes down faster than linearly. It goes with the three half. Okay. One important, very positive point though, is that the frequency of the signature, the amplitude of the signature and the phase of the signature are dependent only on one parameter, which is this cutoff length, which means that we can do a template search. Here are, here's a visualization. This is the worst case scenario where we have that the cutoff is actually <coughs> at the Planck length. And you see, this is the prediction as compared to um, what is the conventional, and you can't see the difference. If you zoom in, you see that there are oscillations, but they are tiny, right? They're very, very tiny, very, very fast, very hard to measure. On the other hand, if the cutoff length is actually um, close, if it is only, if it is four orders of magnitude away from the Planck length, so like two orders of magnitude from the Hubble length, then we see an effect that would be measurable, right? So we basically are already moving this interval. We are squeezing the cutoff length to within four orders of magnitude, the Planck length, right there with this simple um, comparison here. And this is all done with actual realistic values for the best current model of, of inflation. So what are the conclusions then? Well, <clears throat> We, we made the following assumption. We said that while quantum field theory still holds at the inflationary scale, we model the idea that there should be no lengths smaller than LC as mathematically, we model that as no fields with wavelengths smaller than LC should be path integrated over in the path integral. And when we do that, then we obtain predictions for the primordial power spectrum that depend only on one parameter, which is the cutoff scale. Now, one might think, okay, so we are done here, but we are not, we are not. This was a lot of work, but we worked for years on this and we ended up writing 50 pages with um, details because it's so, such a hard calculation to do because the functional analysis, the differential geometry, the numerical analysis of this is, is very interwoven, very intricate and difficult, even though conceptually it's straightforward, it was just hard to do it. Um, so we have these predictions. However, what we now need to do is this. We need to translate the predictions for the primordial power spectrum into pre predictions for the cosmic microwave background spectrum that we actually see in the sky. There is a difference between the two because there is 
um, all of the plasma physics in between. The primordial power spectrum is what we had right after inflation ended. But then there were acoustic oscillations and all of that. That's a whole machinery that needs to be applied in order to translate our predictions for the primordial power spectrum into predictions for the CMB so that we can actually then obtain templates for signatures in the CMB, not in the PPS, but in the CMB, and then perform a template search in the CMB data. And then hopefully we obtain, or for sure, we either obtain a positive signal for some quantum gravity induced LC, or if we don't see that, at least we obtain a new tighter bound on where the cutoff length scale um, could be. So the, um, the summary, this is the last slide, is this. A natural ultraviolet cutoff scale LC is expected to be somewhere between the Planck length and between the Hubble length during inflation. It's really hard to see how it could be elsewhere. Infl inflational cosmology data, experiments, observations can squeeze that into. And we, we want to recruit the, um, the phenomenon that uh, if we model some predictions with few parameters, in this case, just one parameter, then that allows template search. And template search enhances sensitivity through the ability to filter away a lot of the noise. Um, the simplest um, one parameter model of the ultraviolet cutoff is arguably having a finer bandwidth, simply to say that, well, if those lengths don't exist, then we don't sum over them in the path integral. And as a result, we obtain this one parameter prediction for signatures, uh, template signatures in the, in the um, primordial power spectrum. That now needs to be translated into templates for the CMB signature, and then that can be um, used to bound um, where exactly the, um, um, the uh, uh, cutoff scale um, could be in nature, either to measure it or to put a bound. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Akin. All right, so what I, uh, because it's technically the, the question time is, is over, what I'm going to do, I'm going to invite questions not only for Achim, but for any of the speakers in the session, if that's okay. Uh, of course, please feel free to ask questions too about Achim's talk as well. But all the other Sorry speakers for going over time there, sorry. Oh, it's all right, but yeah. Just, uh, the, you are the last talk. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand. <laughs> but I don't want, I, just for fairness to everybody, because uh, we run, run it pretty tight because we have Australian... Okay. Okay, so uh, Bill has a question. Go ahead. Uh, you need to, um, I, I don't know if you, uh, you're muted, Bill. We definitely cannot hear you or see you. Nothing. Okay, oh, now we see I'm you. sorry. Perfect. Uh, I hope you can see me, hear me now. You can. Yep. So I'm I'm a bit confused. Your cutoff is this uh, covariant box on phi less than something. It's less than lambda, but you know, for let's say massless fields, box of phi is equal to zero, and so that still allows arbitrarily high frequencies because omega squared minus k squared is equal to zero uh, for those fields. So this doesn't seem to be a cutoff in either frequency or in wave number space. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, is that what you meant? I mean, when you were talking, it sounded as though you were talking about cutoffs in wave number space, which would not be covariant kind of cutoffs. So I'm a little confused about what you mean. Right. Um, remember that <coughs> that page here, the information theory the interpretation. Um, consider in the simplest case, um, Minkowski space. And what we are cutting off then is the modulus of P naught squared minus P vector squared. Now, when we do that, when right. we so that off, means that P that means that P naught and P vector can be arbitrarily large. Absolutely, exactly. And that's why we then obtain this statement here that you see under the first bullet point. We obtain the spatial modes, so P vectors of a wavelength below the cutoff length still exist. You can't covariantly remove them. You still, they still exist. However, you find that the P naught range is going to be exceedingly small. <laughs> 
You see, if it's just simple inequalities, if you take, uh, if you cut off the modulus of p naught squared minus p vector squared, and p vector is very large beyond the cutoff scale, then yes, p naught can be finite, but only in a tiny range, which means that spatial modes of very short wavelengths, much below the cutoff length, will have a bandwidth in time, because the p naught range is very limited, a bandwidth in time that's very tiny. And that means that these modes are effectively frozen. Now, one may wonder, could this possibly be a covariant statement? And it is. And the reason is that this statement involves two quantities. It involves the wavelength, but also the bandwidth. And wavelengths and bandwidths are both transforming under Lorentz transformations. And they do in such a way that this statement is covariant. It's the same statement in every frame. You can, in every frame, you can say that spatial modes of wavelengths below the cutoff length do exist, but have a bandwidth in time that is so low that they can be effectively considered as frozen. But if I do, uh, if I do a um, <clears throat> Lorentz transformation, I can make omega naught, for example, as small as I want. So the bandwidth is is very large uh, for very small omega or similarly for the, the magnitude of K. So I well, mean, you there, would also... is, there, there are two ways of looking at this. One is to say, I consider a spatial wavelength P vector and then ask what's my um, bandwidth in time, so what's the P naught range? Or I can do what I think you just said, which is I can say, I consider now a temporal wavelength, a P naught, and then I ask, well, what range does that give me for the P vectors? And that's also going to be a bounded range. So for every spatial mode P vector, for every spatial wavelength P vector, I have a bandwidth in time, and for every temporal wavelength, for every frequency P naught, I have a bandwidth in space. And simply by the fact that P naught squared minus P vector squared is a scalar, cutting this off is giving you the exact same physics no matter what frame you use. And that generalizes if you do that for the Dunn-Bergen as well for curved space time. All right. Okay, thank you. I will think about it. Thanks. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Achim. Uh, next hand up is Albert. Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, it's also uh, actually had a couple of questions for Achim. The first one is pretty much the same question that uh, Bill asked already. So I guess I don't have much to say. So maybe just to elaborate on, uh, I guess, an example one can think of. Uh, you know, suppose that you have an almost monochromatic uh, wave for a massless field, as was being discussed, with a very high frequency, and then you have a very slow envelope on that. So why would that be excluded in your case? I don't understand. Why, why would it have to be excluded? I don't know. Oh, well, or, or, well, actually, the question is that I, I thought maybe that would not be excluded, but that would be something that is, on the one hand, oscillating very fast, but it's, it, it's, it lasts for a long time. So I'm not sure how that would fit in this uh, qualitative description that you were providing here connected with this slide. So that just well, that can so be that kind of mode would not be excluded then by your no, no, covariant no. cutoff. You can have... You can have um, field configurations that are oscillating very fast for a long time, okay? Okay, so that's something that, you know, naively one might thought that uh, having some kind of UV cutoff would exclude that, uh, but you are saying that your 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 covariant cutoff is not excluding that, I would agree. I mean, that would be my expectation. So yeah. in that yeah, sense- it, the, Yeah, you see, the, the, it's, it's quite curious because um, you know, the question always arises, how on earth could a minimum length be covariant? Because if it's really a length, can't you just, you know, Lorentz contract it? But it's, it seems that here the, the sampling um, picture shows us a way out, a way to have it covariantly, which is to say that 
<coughs> wavelengths shorter than a certain threshold wavelengths cannot be cut off. They must exist for covariance reasons. But you can have it, and this is what appears here, uh, you can have that in time their bandwidth is very, very small, which means that they are very predictable, right? If the, if the bandwidth in time is very, very small, then um, it suffices to take samples like once every million year, and then you know what the function does everywhere. But I, I, should, I should say that there is something subtle about it. For example, take um, uh, uh, a radio station that is broadcasting at 100 megahertz. And let's say you give it a bandwidth of 100 megahertz to 100 megahertz plus one hertz. In this case, the, uh, the signal has a bandwidth of just one hertz, even though the carrier frequency is a megahertz, <laughs> it has a bandwidth of just one hertz, which means that even though the frequency is high, it's completely predictable what it does. You only need to record the radio station signal once per second, and you know what it does every at, at all times, right? Actually, twice per second, and then you know uh, what it does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess uh, the, the the expectation why uh, probably also for Bill, but why why one often would think that the cutoff uh, should suppress this kind of models. For example, think of calculating the stress tensor for uh, your field, and then these modes that would not be suppressed by this cutoff would still have a huge energy density in a you know in a given in a given in a given uh, reference frame that would um, take that, the <clears throat> that is true and there is a big difference between uh, i mean I, I think you're raising a very interesting point here uh, and let me discuss it both in the euclidean and in the lorentzian signature case if you cut off the momentum uh, space uh, the frequencies in the euclidean signature then you're completely regulating your theory right yes because Right, but that we agree. Such, yeah. yeah, no such. Uh, that's not true in the Lorentzian signature case, and uh, so Dick rotation doesn't help us there because it's really changing the behavior. And in the Lorentzian case, what we do when we cut off in this way is that we remove one integration, just one. <clears throat> and what that means is that, for example, a, a previously quadratic divergence would become a linear one. The linear ones would become. Um, uh, logarithmic one and logarithmic divergences would become convergences. So okay. it's true that it's not it's not regulating everything. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So maybe so. Th this was the first question, as I said, very closely connected to a question that Bill had already asked. The second question or comment is that. Uh, you know, it's it's a more sort of a humble approach, but one thing one can do also in trying to calculate these kind of corrections that you were investigating in uh, assuming that there is this, you know, I guess that the, that the cutoff is close to the Planck length so that you have a few orders of magnitude and you can use effective field theory approach to perturbative quantum gravity, then one can calculate, you know, these corrections uh, to the, uh, the power power spectrum or also for gravitational waves, the, the, the power spectrum. And uh, so typically what finds is that actually the corrections are suppressed even slightly higher with a slightly higher power. So typically you get actually a square uh, suppression of H over uh, the Planck mass. So this was just to say that, you know, there is this other approach that is a bit more agnostic with the UV, the usual effective field theory approach just needs to uh, in principle, to assume that you have sufficient separation of scales between the your cutoff here and the Hubble scale, so pre presumably it's quite close to the the, 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 the the Planck length, and then there you can do the calculation. In fact, you can do it, you know, very you know very detailed calculation with all the machinery of quantum field theory in curved space time and perturbative quantum gravity, and you get these corrections to be suppressed by actually the second power instead of three halves. Uh, second power. So I guess it also seems to imply that your approach and this cutoff and so on doesn't seem to be entirely, you know, uh, agreeing with an effective field theory approach, uh, which one might have thought that if the scale separation is that you could even as a theory make it, you know, assume that the values are larger, that there should be maybe a regime where those uh, would agree. Uh, but 
instead, as I said, you, you get different powers for the first order. Uh, right. Reaction. I think you're raising a very interesting point here. And um, I th there are things in the papers that I didn't mention, but uh, let me mention them now. Um, the the calculation that I presented today is the simplest one, and it is the one where the cutoff is a hard cutoff, where we simply say uh, fields with wavelengths beyond the cutoff length simply don't exist at all. But you could imagine, and this would not spy, spoil covariance, of phasing in that cutoff in a soft way. And that accounts for many more models then. You can keep still covariance, but you cut them off softly, you suppress them not from either no suppression in the past integral to complete suppression in the past integral. You can make a soft cutoff there. And if you do the soft cutoff, then you can get different scalings. And you can imagine it, um, for example, this way that if you do a soft cutoff, it is as if you have a little bit of this cutoff, a little bit of that cutoff, a little bit of that cutoff. And what that does is, that it smears the signature. It makes the signature smaller. And we calculate exactly how it becomes smaller depending on how you model the soft cutoff. Now, you can model the, a soft cutoff in many different ways because you can model exactly, you have lots of choices of how the cutoff goes from you know, one, no cutting, to zero, complete cutting. You know, there's different shapes of functions you can choose. Um, what we found is that the prediction of the phase depends on how you soften the cutoff. The prediction of the amplitude depends crucially on how you do the cutoff, because if you make the cutoff very soft, then the amplitude of your predicted uh, um, signature goes down way more, and you could for sure accommodate a scaling goal where it goes to the second power. But something that is quite robust is the prediction of the frequencies, of the frequency of that chirp. That we found is essentially always the same as long as the smooth cutoff still has a well-defined middle where you could say, okay, this is now halfway down the cutoff. The frequency of the chirp is, or the, the frequencies of the chirp are determined by where you cross the threshold, where you go from not so much uh, cutting off to fully cutting off. But you know, that, that is just way more parameters if you do it that right, way, right? So and, then, uh, you know that then then we lose predictive power. So we focused on the hard cut off case. That's kind of the best case scenario. That that would be the signature that's the easiest, the most likely to be found. Okay. So, qu quick follow up to that, but, but wouldn't it be then a good idea to identify what model can reproduce the the weak gravity prediction? I mean, one would expect that any theory for quantum gravity, right, whatever it is should be compatible with uh, QFT in spaces with uh, perturbative gravity, right? So maybe it's a-, a, a, a Yeah, I'm uh, expecting it can be translated into a, uh, into a soft cutoff function. Yeah, so maybe choose, it selects some functions, right? That would reproduce the, yeah. rather than give you, give you a new parameter, it selects a particular- oh, That's right, I mean, actually that would be very desirable because if you can, yeah. as long as you can constrain it, right? As long mm -hmm. as you have some idea of, what cutoff you're looking for, maybe with one, two, maybe three parameters, then you can do templates with two or three parameters and that helps cut through the noise. Yeah. All right, anyway, more questions for Ahim or for any of the speakers of the session, if they're still here, <laughs> of course. If not, of course, we can always have Slack. All right, well. I don't I mean, see any more. If, if there right, are no Albert, more yeah. questions in the meantime, maybe just a, a sort of follow up to this last question. Uh, I, I know that you know in the community there have been further calculations on on uh, you know for for inflationary backgrounds, but uh, I myself you know we did some you know very detailed calculations for for a Sitter background. I know that's not exactly an inflationary background, but I was wondering how many of your predictions, in particular this one that seems robust and crucial for you about this kind of frequency that you have. Uh, would you expect that that, or if one thought of the gravitational wave spectrum, for example, I know that that's harder to observe, but from a, from a sort of calculation of point of view, would you expect to have those features there as well? In, for example, if you calculated uh, the, the gravitational wave power spectrum in, in a the background with your machinery, 
would you expect to get similar behavior? Uh, because then again, you know, one can compare with very detailed calculations based on perturbative uh, quantum gravity or well, an effective field theory. And I guess it can be interesting, you know, to see yeah. the differences and whether such a scale, such a well-defined frequency scale is there or not and so on. <laughs> Very good question. And we answered it in the paper. Um, so that's why it's 50 pages. <laughs> so we did calculate it also for the tensor fluctuations. Well, uh -huh. knowing that they are not going to be measured uh, Sure. At least not with that precision. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, but yes, we did. We did that. And the only thing that we need there uh, is, I mean, basically we say um, it could be the sitter, it could be power law, it could be whatever slow roll the model gives. We we feed the slow roll parameters into the calculations, and out we get the chirp, the uh, you know the frequency, the amplitude, the phase. So uh, I mean, you can consider behavior for the tensor spectrum then as well? Yes, for the scalar and yeah. for the tensor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, yeah, so we, we, I mean, I know that others have done it also for inflationary backgrounds, but we we did a very detailed calculation there. I guess one could compare, I don't remember, we saw these kind of features. Also, by the way, there was a very subtle thing there that usually is not is overlooked, but is that when you calculate very carefully these things, uh, you know, doing covariant renormalization and so on within this approach, um, it turns out that actually uh, the power spectrum as you define it is actually ill-defined. Namely, if you take, you have the two-point function that you consider in, let's say, in, in, in space-time coordinates. And then as you define it, you took uh, equal times and then uh, you took the spatial Fourier transform, right? So that's the way it's usually defined. And usually if you do a tree level calculation, that's perfectly fine. Uh, however, it turns out that once you start including, you know, uh, loop corrections, in general, that quantity is not well defined, it's divergent. Uh, it has somehow to do with the fact that when you take, when you perform the, the, the integral over spatial momentum, in some sense, you are considering pairs of points which are very close uh, in space, and that is not always giving a finite thing. And so for a calculation from tree level, a two-point function in tree level, that's fine. But once you start including uh, you know, loop corrections, that actually is divergent. But it's divergent after you perform the usual you know, renormalization and so on, so that your two-point functions as you know, two-point functions in space-time are perfectly finite, perfectly fine, and then it's just that this definition of this object, the, 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 the power spectrum defined in that way as equal time and then performing, you know, a Fourier transform over, over, over spatial momentum, that in general is not guaranteed to be a well-defined thing, to be, to be finite. And as I said, for, for three-level calculations, that is finite. But uh, once you include uh, uh, loop corrections, that, that in fact is not the case. So that is another subtlety that in, in this, you know, Perturbative, calcul perturbative quantum gravity calculation as an effective field theory. You can do that all very carefully with all these tools. And so you can see uh, all these effects. But anyway, I guess it, I, I feel it's, it's probably interesting to try to compare with uh, some of these uh, calculations where you can do these things. I agree. With, that would be very interesting. To me. Yeah. Please send me uh, the reference. I'll, I'll, I'll send you the link. Yes, I'll send you the link. Thank you.